Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, New Research and Insights on Youth Disconnection, Understanding the Impacts of COVID-19. This webinar is hosted by Measure of America of the Social Science Research Council and co-hosted in partnership with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Offices of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, and MDRC. Today's webinar will be for one hour ending at 2 p.m., and this webinar will be recorded. My name is Vicki Lassiter, and I will be moderating today's session. All of our audience lines have been muted. However, we encourage you to submit questions for speakers throughout the webinar as you think of them by clicking the chat box link at the bottom of your screen. We will take one question following each of the presenters, and we will have Q&A following our last presentation. Our speakers will address as many questions as time permits. During today's webinar, we hope to go both deep and wide in discussing new research, insights, and resources designed to help address the needs of opportunity youth during the pandemic and beyond. Today, we are delighted to be joined by Kristen Lewis, Director and Co-Founder of Measure of America of the Social Science Research Council. Kristen has co-authored three volumes of Measure of America's National Human Development Reports, well-being reports for California, Louisiana, Mississippi, as well as Marin and Sonoma counties, reports for Los Angeles and New York metro areas, and of course, Measure of America's Youth Disconnection series. Before starting Measure of America in 2007, Kristen worked as a policy specialist in the United Nations Development Program and has served as a consultant for numerous international development organizations, including UNICEF and the World Bank. We are also joined by Louisa Treskin, Senior Research Associate at MDRC, where Louisa primarily focuses on evaluations of programs serving young adults seeking to advance their education and careers. Her recent projects include Reconnecting Youth, which she'll be talking about today, as well as the Job Corps Evidence Building Project and the Procedural Justice and Form Alternatives to Contempt. And her past projects have included evaluations for the Annie Casey Foundation's Learn and Earn to Achieve Potential, Youth Build, and the Pace Center for Girls. We'll also hear from Emma Alterman, a researcher in MDRC's K-12 education policy area, where she specializes in implementation, qualitative methods, and operations. Emma is currently leading implementation research on two Institute of Education Science Research grants. And our last presenter will be Caitlin Jones, a social science analyst with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, where Caitlin supports and manages project, projects which have included the National Poverty Research Center Program and implementing national convenings, including an annual forum, policy-focused research panels, and learning exchange discussions and human service priorities. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Kristen Lewis to begin our first presentation. Kristen, you are on mute. All right, good to know. That's a very key part of the presentation is being able to be heard. Um, I was just thanking you, Vicki, and also thanking um, our other guests today. Uh, so today I'll just talk briefly to you about the findings of our most recent uh, report on youth disconnection in a disrupted year. Um, and I will, um, yeah, I will talk to you about our findings and I'll also the various caveats related to the data for this year. Um, so Measure of America is a nonpartisan research um, project, research and advocacy project of the Social Science Research Project, uh, Social Science Research Council. Um, we have three areas of work. We create human development reports using our American Human Development Index. We create online um, tools that have well being statistics and indicators, and we work on the topic of youth disconnection. So, why do, we, why do we do that? So, first, just to say what our kind of conceptual framework is um, we are guided by the human development and capabilities approach that was developed at the United Nations by Amartya Sen and other leading um, economists. And their idea was to create a way to think about progress and measure well-being, moving away from just economic indicators like GDP to other things that matter for people's choices and opportunities. 
So the human development and capabilities approach is really saying that what we need to be doing is building people's capabilities to lead a freely chosen, flourishing life. And lots of things are in the sort of set of our capabilities. So like, are we able to participate in politics on an equal footing with others? Do we enjoy um, equality before the law? Um, can we practice our religion or our cultural beliefs, so forth, and things like that. Um, it's very hard to measure all those things. So the Human Development Index measures just three areas, which are seen as kind of core capabilities or the basic building blocks of a life of choice and value. And those are a long and healthy life, access to knowledge, and a decent standard of living. And the reason we focus on youth disconnection is that um, those sort of late teen, early 20 years are tremendously important for building the capabilities we need for a flourishing adulthood. You know, it's when you get degrees, when you learn about yourself, when you start to network, when you have your first job, things like that. So young people who are cut off from school and work opportunities are really not given the same chance to lay the groundwork for a flourishing adulthood as are connected young people. So that's why um, we care about this issue and why we work in this space. So um, like everything else, data collection during COVID was really affected. And the way in which it was affected um, means uh, we have to give you some caveats before we provide these numbers. So we've been providing the youth disconnection rate for since 2012 or so um, with our annual reports. And this year, we just want to you know, be um, honest about the limitations that, that we're facing. So of course, COVID-19 disrupted the normal methods of everyone doing everything, including people who work for um, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. And that's the source of our data um, that we use to calculate youth disconnection. So lots of things that normally happen couldn't happen. So um, the people who worked there weren't able to be in the office to mail out surveys. They couldn't staff call centers to follow up. Um, and the, these problems were really quite pronounced during um, the first half of 2020, which is of course when COVID really took hold when everything was shutting down. So as a result, there were lower survey response rates um, for the American Community Survey. And, but they weren't sort of evenly spread out. It wasn't like normally there are 100 survey responses and now there are 90 spread out evenly among all different kinds of people. It didn't work like that at all, unfortunately. So compared to previous years, um, people who lived in single family homes, were married, had bachelor's degree, were citizens and had higher than average incomes were more likely than normal to fill out the service survey. Now, those are the very same groups who are the least likely to have um, to experience disconnection. So young people growing up in families, you know, with married parents who have bachelor's degrees, they're much less likely to be disconnected between the ages of 16 and 24. And again, that means not in school and not working um, than are um, other groups of young people. So that group was sort of overrepresented. And um, in addition, other groups who are more likely to experience disconnection were underrepresented. So people living in apartments, um, in group quarters, um, members of um, Latino or black communities, low income people, they were all much less likely to fill out the survey than normal. And the Census Bureau tried to um, adjust this data, you know, and they improved the quality and the data bias um, to some degree. But even with these adjusted weights, there are still, um, like for instance, unemployment rate is still lower than expected. So the takeaway is that this is still the best data source we have, um, but the youth disconnection rates I'll be showing are likely underestimates, underestimate. So the results, the rates are at least this high and likely higher. And again, I'm gonna talk about the past. The Census Bureau has cautioned against using this data and comparing it to past data. I'm really just using the past data to talk about the past and, and the trends that, that we had right up until the eve of COVID-19 um, appearing on the scene. So um, America's disconnected young people, again, the definition is young people 16 to 24 who are neither working nor in school and the data come from the American Community Survey. So the rate is now 12.6%, which again, we think it's this high or possibly higher. 
And this is about 4.8 um, million young people. So the disconnection rate had really been falling for about 10 years. So um, you see like 2010 or so, it was really at the height, 14.7%. That was just out from the Great Recession. So you see in 2008, the, the rate spiked. Um, it was very high for a while. It took quite a long time for it to fall. But in recent years, especially, it's been falling. Um, so this represents kind of a dramatic turnaround of a 10-year trend. Um, so although disconnection rates have gone up for everyone, the, the fact that there are these big differences and distances between racial and ethnic groups, that was true before, and unfortunately it's still true now. Um, the rate for Native American young people is 23.4%. That's the highest rate, um, followed by Black young people with 19.6%. Latino young people, the rate is 14%. White young people, 10.6% and Asian young people, 7.3%. Um, and we were able to disaggregate um, by women and men for these large racial and ethnic groups. For most um, ethnic groups, um, for white and black um, young people, for instance, um, men have a higher rate of disconnection than women. That's been true for some time. Um, also, for, also for Native Americans. Um, Whereas for Asians and Latinos, it's about the same in this year's, in this year's data set. And of course, these are super wide uh, categories. Um, to say Asian is to encompass um, people coming, people who have origins in countries um, around, around the world. And so whenever possible, we try to disaggregate um, biracial and ethnic group. So here we see dis disconnection by Asian subgroup. And we see this um, quite quite um, large range. So um, Chinese young people um, have a rate of 4.7%. So I think that's the lowest we have um, calculated for this year. Whereas Hmong young people um, are almost 13% of uh, youth disconnection. And just to say Pacific Islanders are included in this group of Asians. Um, in most of our work, we try wherever possible to disaggregate. Um, Pacific Islanders, uh, Hopi people, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, um, because they have many different, quite different outcomes than other Asian groups. Um, we don't have that for this year, um, though we do have more disaggregation than usual because of the data. The data was, again, funny. Um, so for instance, we're able to make a, an estimate for Pakistani young people, which we haven't been able to do in the past. And now just to move on to youth disconnection by place. So in terms of region, um, the West North Central region and New England have the lowest rates. The East South Central and West South Central regions have the highest rates. And again, you can, I don't wanna go through every table, but this is all um, on our report and website that you can um, download. And you see rates varying by race and ethnicity. Here we have youth disconnection by state. So the lowest state is Nebraska with a rate of 7.8%. The highest is New Mexico where almost one in five young people are out of school and out of work. And here we have um, youth disconnection rates um, by metro area. So here we see the lowest um, metro areas in terms of their rate of dis youth disconnection, um, Provo or Utah, um, San the San Jose area, Madison, Wisconsin, these have the lowest overall rates of youth disconnection. But again, even an average at the metro level can hide a lot of variation. So if you look at Madison, um, you see that the rate for Black young people is 21.2%, extremely high, even though the rate for the, the whole place is 8.2%. So whenever possible, again, we disaggregate by race, ethnicity, and gender. And then we see, you know, a lot of uh, different, different kinds of findings. And here we see um, the most populous metro areas with the highest youth disconnection rate. Um, so McAllen, Edinburgh and Mission, Texas, Bakersfield, California, and Albuquerque, New Mexico have the country's highest youth disconnection rates. And then, um, we always do it by congressional district as well. And um, California's district 52 has 5.3%, the lowest. And Michigan's district 14, um, which is the Detroit area, 
um, one out of four young people are out of school and out of work. So in terms of the kinds of recommendations we make, you know, we always make this first one about directing resources to areas and groups that have the highest rates of youth disconnection, and also to recognize that different populations have different challenges and needs. So um, tailoring your approaches is critically important. Um, but one thing we're really um, emphasizing this year is the worry that young people who fell through the cracks in the last two years might sort of be permanently sidelined. We did some research a few years ago that looked at the long-term effects of youth disconnection. And we found that young people who'd been out of school and out of work between the ages of 16 and 24, if you looked at them by the time they got to their 30s, those who had been connected were earning about $30,000 more than those who'd been disconnected during that time. Uh, they were more likely to own their own home. They reported higher um, levels of, of good health, things like that. Um, and the longer someone was out of school and out of work, the more pronounced the effects. So again, we're just concerned about, um, about for all youth, all disconnected youth, of course, people who were off track before um, the, the COVID epidemic struck, but there's a, a particularly poignant thing about people who are sort of on track um, and now might be, might be thrown off. Um, so we don't wanna forget about those, about those young people. So that is it for me. And I think Vicki maybe is gonna ask some questions now. Yes, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, I do want to let everyone know that we are going to be sending a recording of this uh, session to everyone. So you will have access again to see all the slides and presentation materials. Kristen, one question that came through um, that I do want to share is if you could ex expand a little bit more in terms of who fell through the cracks. You have mentioned that some folks fell through the cracks and if you can give a little bit more context to that. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So one thing that we were really struck um, by is to see the decline in college going um, during COVID. And we found that although young people going to a four-year college, the rate fell only a little bit, like one, two percent, whereas the rate for young people going to community college fell a lot, um, more like 10 percent. And what we saw also was that for first time college goers going to community college, the rate of um, the rate for college going fell among um, black and Latino young people by close to like 30% um, and much less for um, white and Asian young people. So in terms of who fell through the cracks, you know, we really do see that it was um, young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, young people who are Black and Latino and Native American, um, whereas more affluent young people who maybe were headed to a four-year college were less affected. And I'm not saying they weren't terribly affected. You know, they were. They were home. They were miserable. Um, lots of their plans were disrupted. But they did overwhelmingly find a way to continue to be attached um, to their educational system and their, their school, their trajectory. So um, yeah, and then another thing is that there were huge gaps in attendance among high schoolers. And I mean, just imagine if you were already someone at risk of dropping out, if you were somewhat more tenuously attached to your school, and then you didn't even have to go there. And then you're trying to connect to school maybe with a handheld device, if your family didn't have enough computers, maybe you're living in a place where the connection isn't very strong. So if, you, if it was already a challenge, you know, even the most, you know, thriving, successful student was really, really struggling in this time. And so someone who was already challenged in connecting to school, um, you know, that that group was was really, really hard hit. And these are the same groups whose families were disproportionately getting ill from and even dying from COVID. So the challenges were just um, way more than this population of young people could really be expected to, to bear. Hey, thank you so much, Kristen. I'm going to ask if you could stop sharing so we can get ready for our next presenter. Uh, folks know that we are going to be taking questions at the end, but now I would like to welcome Emma and Louisa from MDRC to share their presentation. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Louisa Trescon, and I'm a senior research associate at MDRC. 
MDRC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan social policy research organization. We build and apply evidence about changes in policy and practices that can improve the well being of people who have low incomes. And um, next slide, please. There we go. All right, so um, I'm going to be talking about the findings from the Reconnecting Youth Project. Um, I'd like to thank um, ASPE for funding this work and also acknowledge our key partners, Child Trends. So first I'm going to give an introduction, a high level introduction to the project, first focusing on the motivations underlying the project, our goals and our overall approach to the work. And then we'll take deeper dives into the products we developed and what we learned. And we'll, um, if there's time, conclude with a short tour of our interactive tools that you all can access on, online. But first, I'm going to also start with a conceptual framework um, so you know about what this project is about and how we really focused our scope and our work. So we focus on young people ages 16 to 24 who are not working nor in school. Um, and though that definition, you know, is straightforward at a point in time, it can mask much of the diversity of young people who are disconnected and the complexity of the programs and systems that they interact with some of which um, Kristen was unpacking in her, in her presentation. So these are young people with varying needs and circumstances in terms of their age, their education level, their prior um, system involvement, or work experience. They're, they may access supports in a variety of systems and settings, be it K-12, nonprofits, workforce system, employers, and the programs that support them focus on many different um, outcomes and, and um, strategies, such as education, mental and physical health, employment, housing. So it's really a very complex um, system. And so given that, if we could advance the slide, Emma. Given that complexity, we had to focus the scope of this project um, to really focus on a specific, you know, what in terms of what aspect of the work we're focusing on and who we are focusing on. So it's not about all young people who have periods of disconnection, nor all the policies and programs that are trying to support them. So we chose to focus on programs that serve young people that are focused on education and employment outcomes. So this means that the very valuable system change efforts are not a focus of our work nor are programs that are focused on other aspects of well-being, such as mental health or justice system involvement. And then given the dynamic nature of youth disconnection, we also wanted to narrow the focus on young people who are most at risk of being disconnected for long periods of time. This longitudinal research shows that most young people will reconnect eventually, but there are a share of young people who are really at risk of being disconnected for a very long period of time. And literature has shown that less is known about how to reconnect, engage, and help these young people. So that's where we focused. Of course, there's no clear definition of who are the young people who are most at risk of persistent disconnection, but the closest approximation that we found was um, looking at the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act out of school youth eligibility criteria which captures a lot of the risk factors that young people may have that are associated with persistent disconnection, such as having prior systems involvement or not finishing high school. So that's where we focused. Um, and then what were the goals of our project? What did we want to accomplish? So this project tries to take a step back from asking the question that we're often asked as researchers, uh, what works, to say, what do we know? And there are three goals within that. The first being, it's not about research, but focuses on understanding what is happening on the, on the ground. Given the complex service environment I just spoke about, there is a need to understand more about what programs are doing in practice. Because many of the programs that young people may reconnect to are small, they're local, they haven't been studied, they're not well known. So we wanted right. to understand systematically what are they doing. And then once there was that understanding of what programs are doing, the next step was to assess the state of the evidence on these programs and practices. And then we took that information and put it into an evidence gap map. Next slide. 
And so there are two products that resulted from this work. They are available online. They have reports associated with them. Um, so you can either interact with them or you can read the report. So you can do both. And we'll be talking a little bit more about them in a moment. The first is a compendium of programs. That's an online searchable database of 78 programs um, serving this population. Um, and then the second tool is an interactive evidence gap map that has 60 studies that align with that scope criteria of programs focused on education and work serving this population. So it's all available on the website and I'm gonna hand it over to Emma to talk about the compendium. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, my name is Emma Alterman. I'm a research associate at MDRC. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the compendium today. Um, so first, just as a little overview of how we found these programs. Um, so to find the programs for inclusion in the compendium, um, we conducted a search for these programs. We identified a large range of programs by searching websites of federal agencies, funders, a lot more. We did a public call for programs. Um, we applied the scope criteria that Louisa walked us through before, leaving us with 114 programs. Um, and then we were faced with the question of, well, how do we gather comprehensive information about all of these different programs? Um, so we decided that the best way to get both comprehensive and standardized information from all these programs um, was to administer a qualitative questionnaire, which we did in spring 2021. Programs were sent this questionnaire via email. We got 78 responses. Those are the programs in the compendium. Um, and you'll hear more about the questionnaire um, also from our colleague, Caitlin at ASPE. Um, but in this uh, presentation, we're gonna focus on the main buckets of information gathered in the compendium um, and in the questionnaire, which is the general program information, target outcomes, services and activities, implementation practices, and finally evaluation information. Um, and so the compendium has all this information as well as whether each of the programs are, has associated studies and evidence gap map. So um, let's dig into the programs a little bit. Um, so first it's important to note that we had a diverse set of programs. Um, so they reflect diverse geographies, years of experience, annual number of participants served. They cover all 50 states um, plus several territories and Washington, D.C. Um, programs operate in um, just one state or a metropolitan area for the most part, but there are also several large federal programs like Job Corps or Youth Build that operate in 40 or more states each. Um, the sample has both newer and older programs, um, and the size ranges greatly, um, though the median was about 250 participants annually. Um, the programs also had a few similar characteristics when you look across the sample. Um, so for the most part, programs are focused on young people, average minimum age being 16, average maximum age being 24, which you'll note aligns perfectly with that WIOA um, definition for youth um, that Louisa just went over. Uh, the programs are also operated mostly by community-based organizations and they get public funding. They were both long in duration and intensity, indicating a high intended dosage of services throughout um, and an extended engagement. Um, so 27% of programs that described their duration said it was six to 12 months, an additional 35 said it was more than a year. Um, and there was a large um, range, a wide range in terms of what how many hours participants were expected to engage in services, anywhere from one to 40 hours a week. Um, but most programs estimated about 30 hours per week. Um, so what did these programs look like? What were they doing? Um, so we asked them about their targeted outcomes. Um, so as expected with the scope, all programs target at least one education and employment outcome, um, which you can see in those dark blue bars, um, indicating any education or employment outcome. Um, so interestingly, the vast majority of programs, 88% reported targeting both education and employment outcomes, indicating that they focus on a range of outcomes rather than kind of specializing in one area or the other. Um, for education, looking at those light blue bars, we can see that they mostly focus on basic skills gains, high school completion, or post-secondary enrollment. Um, for employment, they target mostly shorter term outcomes. So placement and readiness rather than out longer term outcomes like retention and earnings. 
The next section of the questionnaire dove into the various services that programs provide. Um, so the list of services that we asked about was developed in consultation with experts and programs tended to offer a really wide range of services to meet individual needs. Um, our goal in asking these questions was to understand which services were intended for all young people in the program um, versus those that were offered only to those who need them. Um, so we asked programs to distinguish whether services were core, uh, core practices offered on an as needed basis or rarely or never offered. Um, so we'll look at several figures that look like this with the three colors in the bars, um, the darkest blue indicating the percent of programs reporting that a service is core to their model, medium blue is for offered on an as needed basis, light blue rarely or never. Um, I'm going to encourage you to not get too lost in the weeds, even though it's super tempting, um, and just pay attention kind of to the story that's on the screen. These figures are all in our report and you can look in more detail later. Um, but while we're here, <laughs> the education services, um, we can look here first. So most programs provided both secondary and post-secondary services, um, indicating that they might have a main service, but they really work to meet young people where they are. Um, you'll see that uh, most of the education services were offered on at least an as-needed basis, with the exception of dual enrollment, which was never offered around half of the time. Looking at employment services, we can see that most programs have um, both work readiness services uh, to prepare young people for the labor market and job placement supports to give young people the skills that they need to gain a foothold in the labor market. Um, we see career exploration, work readiness, placement or, refer or referrals um, are the most common practices, things like entrepreneurial skills, supported employment, and supports for employers were offered least often as a core practice. I think this is a really interesting slide. There were a high percentage of programs that provide support services, um, and this really suggests we think that programs provide comprehensive supports for young people to help them overcome barriers um, that they might face entering education or employment. Um, you can see on this table that there are very, very few practices um, that are offered rarely or never by programs. So that light blue teal on the end is quite narrow. Um, connections to a caring adult and follow-up services were offered most frequently as core practices in this area. Um, finally, we have implementation practices. We asked about a lot of them, <laughs> um, but these we asked programs just to say whether they were a um, primary practice in the model or not a primary practice, which so this is a dichotomous one. Um, and all programs reported implying at least one youth development practice in their delivery of services. Uh, programs also often employed practices required of WIOA funding, which you might expect to see, um, as well as community partnerships and collaboration. Um, and almost all programs used at least one racial equity practice, such as having a racial equity framework or representation of participant demographics in program leadership and staff. Um, so, Looking at all this as a whole, we can draw a few conclusions. Um, the compendium has a diverse set of programs serving young people. Um, these programs target both education and employment outcomes, and that is mirrored in the services that are offered as well. Um, the support services are very often um, offered as a core practice or on an as needed basis to young people and uh, youth development approaches and racial equity approaches uh, practices are very common as well. Um, so understanding the state of these programs really sets us up well to explore the evidence in the field and whether there are gaps and opportunities for more learning between what's happening in the field and the evidence. And with that, I will pass it off to Louisa who will walk us through the evidence gap now. Great, thanks, Emma. So I'm going to talk about the overall findings from the evidence gap map, but it's a really comprehensive online tool. Um, so I encourage you all, if you're interested in learning more, to go and interact with it, because that's what, the, what it's there for. So <laughs> the goal of the Reconnecting Youth Evidence Gap Map is to document and visually describe how much and what types of evidence is available on the practices to reconnect youth to school and work. Um, along the scope criteria we talked about 
earlier. So what are evidence gap maps? They are a systematic assessment of evidence to understand gaps and guide future research. Um, and they're a relatively new tool developed in the last 20 years. Like a systematic review, they, are they use a defined scope to search for, screen, and code studies. But they're generally intended to show what evidence exists, not what the evidence says. And that will be the focus of what I'm talking about today, what evidence exists. Um, so we used our scope criteria to search for in screen studies, which we then coded to look at the practices described in the studies, the outcomes measured, the study methods used, and included all of that information in the map. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the findings now. In the next slide. All right, so some of this overlaps a lot with what Emma just talked about. So thinking about the programs that were studied in these 60 studies that we identified, um, we see that programs are comprehensive and include youth development approaches, supportive services, but really focus on the early steps of reconnection to education and employment. So practices that focus on maybe later um, steps such as career advancement or post-secondary completion were not as common in the studies. Additionally, some of those program implementation um, practices that Emma described programs describing um, having a lot of were not as thoroughly described or very not very common in the studies we looked at. So that's about the practices used by the program studied. And then on the next slide, I'll talk about what was measured in the studies in terms of impacts or outcomes on for young people. And we found again that most studies measured short-term education or employment outcomes. Fewer studies measured long-term post-secondary degree attainment or job retention outcomes. And kind of maybe when Kristen was talking about, you know, well-being made me think about this as well, that we found few studies that measured well-being outcomes, even though the programs are very comprehensive in the supports they were providing to young people. Next slide. So another opportunity to understand more about what we know and what we need to learn is comparing the evidence gap map and the compendium. Um, so starting on the left side of the screen, or the slide, we can see that there were some practices that were common in the compendium, meaning the programs they're widespread in use currently, and were documented quite a bit in studies, such as preparation for high school equivalency, work readiness training, and the provision of support services within programs. But then there were some practices that were common in the compendium, in, or more common in the compendium, but not at all common in the evidence that we found. So one example is program, 40% of programs described employer engagement as being a core practice for them, but we only found two studies describing that activity. Um, similar with career pathways approaches and racial equity and inclusion approaches, things that were common, programs said were common, but we didn't find them yet, it much described in the evidence. And then there were some practices that we looked at because experts we consulted for this project told us they were important and potentially innovative, but we didn't found them either in the compendium or the evidence gap map, such as two generation models or dual enrollment. So I'm going, uh, next slide. So our um, report talks a lot about how we might use um, uh, the evidence gap map. Um, we're running out of time, so I will encourage you to explore the map, explore the reports, and um, look forward to what people are able to, how people are able to use it. Great, thanks so much, Louisa and Emma. That was really great to see. Um, one question I have is something that came up in the Q&A for the chat was, are there any examples right now, I know this is a fairly new tool, of how practitioners or policymakers or folks are actually using these tools? Um, the tools are brand new a month ago. Um, I can say that, uh, I don't have any specific examples yet of how people are using them, but one of the, the hopes that we have, particularly for practitioners, is that they're able to explore the tools to identify programs that may be doing something that they're interested in doing or taking on, or explore the evidence to think about 
Are there ways that we can mine existing evidence about sort of how a practice was implemented to identify best practices or strategies to make um, programs more effective? Great. We look forward to hearing more and seeing more examples of how folks are using this tool as well. So yes, I'm going to ask. Love to hear examples. Yes, please. I'm, I'm encouraging folks. Folks always love when they're building something to hear how folks are using it. So please reach out to Emma and Louisa and let them know how you're using these tools. This time, I'm going to turn things over to Caitlin Jones from ASPE to start her presentation. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Caitlin Jones, a social science analyst at the US Department of Health and Human Services in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. And our office serves as the principal advisor to the Secretary on Policy Development and plays a key role in policy coordination, legislation development, strategic planning, policy research, evaluation, and economic analysis. Today, I will be sharing some information from our soon to be released infographic on connecting youth during the COVID-19 pandemic. My colleague Lisa Trivitz and I were the project officers on this, but I also wanted to give a quick shout out to the reconnecting youth team from MDRC and Child Trends uh, who helped us collect the data used for this infographic. So a little bit of background, oops. Um, this infographic explores the impacts the COVID-19 pandemic had on programs that help youth reconnect to education, obtain employment and advance in the labor market. And it really focuses on highlighting what adaptations they made um, in our population of focus, similar to the, well, exactly the same as the Reconnecting Youth Project, um, were programs that serve young people ages 16 to 24 who experience disconnection from school and work. Um, and this information was gathered through a qualitative questionnaire fielded in the spring of 2020. And as I mentioned before, this project is closely related related to the project and the Reconnecting Youth Project MDRC just presented on, since the information was collected from the same programs via the same qualitative questionnaire, we had just put in some COVID-19 specific questions. Um, because we really wanted to get information from programs on what education, job training, and supportive services, in addition to what enrollment and implementation practices were added or ended during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. So as a reminder, a total of 78 programs completed the questionnaire. And then when we analyzed the COVID-19 specific questions, we found that overall 21 programs reported both adding or ending one or more services, 22 reported only adding one or more services, eight programs reported only ending one or more services, and 27 didn't report adding or ending services at all. And I think this is um, good information to have. Um, I think it shows that, you know, programs either stayed the same or they ended or sorry, added services and sometimes ended, but only eight only ended. So I think that's positive. Um, and one thing I would also like to note that in a few cases, it was difficult to determine whether the organization ended a service or just ended in person and now offers it virtually. Um, so we're first going to look at education services. Um, so nine programs reported ending education services. And actually, of those nine, five also reported adding a service. Um, and then 20 programs added education services. And of those 20 programs, 70% stated they switched to or offered some kind of new educational service virtually. Um, and then on the right here, it just goes a little bit more into depth on what specific education services um, programs added. So some helped youth by supplying technology such as hardware and or Wi-Fi. Um, some provided digital learning services, tools and or training. Um, some distributed income assistance um, specifically for educational purposes. And one became a high school equivalency testing center and offered PPE. And one expanded eligibility criteria to actually serve all youth in the community. Um, and so for job training services, we saw 12 programs and job 
training services. And of those 12 programs, 67% reported a reduction slash loss of employment site. And this is not featured on the slide, but I did want to mention that in addition to the loss of employment sites, uh, 20 5% of those programs also reported a loss of community partners. Um, and then for added, we had 19 programs, add job training services. And this bar graph at the bottom really goes over uh, the percentage of programs that added a particular job training service. So we saw um, you know, added remote internships, apprenticeships, and or jobs, um, new job training and or supports. Again, many transitioned to virtual service delivery, distributed technology, and provided uh, learning services and training. Um, and then for supportive services, we saw five programs reported ending supportive services, and 80% of those um, reported ending one or more in-person services, supportive services. Um, and I will add that one of those that did end the in-person service also said that they did, um, were able to transition and provide that service virtually. Um, and then for added supportive services, we had 22 programs report that they added a supportive service. And the most type, common type of supportive service that was added was to meet the basic needs of youth, such as cash assistance, housing and utility payments, food assistance, um, and more. And I just wanted to mention in addition to the supportive services to meet youth basic needs. Um, additional supportive services that were added were COVID-19 testing and PPE, peer support groups for staff, um, and mental health supports and trauma-informed care. And then for enrollment practices, um, 13 programs reported ending enrollment practices and 21 programs reported adding enrollment practices. Um, and on the right here, this graphic kind of shows an overview of what enrollment practices were ended, such as job fairs, community and school events, street outreach, and in-person services, such as interviews, orientation, et cetera. Um, and then some of the enrollment practices that added, again, transition to virtual services, increased social media presence and outreach, um, as well as offering supportive services and case management. Um, and I did want to highlight um, some of the added virtual enrollment services, um, which included information sessions, virtual meet and greets, uh, use of digital platforms for recruitment and outreach. Um, so you can see that programs got creative, um, which is great. Um, and then finally, um, just quickly looking at implementation practices. Um, so we had two programs who reported ending implementation practices and actually the only implementation that they reported ending was the ability to conduct in-person services. Um, so since it was only two, obviously that was a little surprising to us since it seems more than that ended in-person services. Um, but I think a lot of them reported losing specific services in person um, and not changing everything to in or virtual. Um, and then for then we had nine programs add implementation practices and the bar graph on the bottom kind of gives an overview of um, some of the newly added implementation practices, which included COVID-19 education and resources, wraparound services, racial equity practices, and hazard pay um, for program sponsored opportunities for youth. Um, um, and so thank you so much. Um, the infographic has not been released yet. We do expect that in the next week or two. Um, so you can either go on the ASTI website and find it, or um, please feel free to email me as well, and I will make sure to send you that infographic. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. We are definitely all looking forward to seeing that infographic. So we'll be sure to share the link to your website so folks can find that easily in the next couple of weeks. I am gonna open it up now for questions for all of our presenters. Um, I wanna lift up a really great comment that was shared in the chat box, which was just thinking about that there are no overnight results in this work. 
Uh, the duration piece is really, really important, especially for funders to keep that in mind as they think about how they're supporting this work. Um, I also want to ask the question of Kristen, uh, specifically in reference to the youth disconnection data. Um, are there any commonalities found in the metro areas with the lowest disconnection and vice versa with the highest disconnection? Uh, sure. Um, so I would say that especially looking at data from previous years, as I mentioned, the data this year are a little bit funny. So I'm always kind of reluctant to make big pronouncements based on um, what we're seeing from 2020. Um, but in the past, we've seen that, for instance, Boston um, is almost always having the lowest rate. Right? They're not they're not this year, but in general, or um, Minneapolis, again, and these are places that have um, kind of a large share of their of their young people are enrolled in, in college, and they have a lot of colleges and institutions of higher learning. So, you know, again, the rate is the share of adults 16, young adults 16, 24, who are not school working. So if you have a place with it's drawing tons of young people, like say Boston is, um, to come to college, those are all people who are going to be categorized in that basic group, and they will all be connected. And so as a result, the rate um, will, will be less. So again, we're seeing like Boston, San Jose, things like that, these kind of places that have um, a lot of universities tend to have lower rates of youth, youth disconnection. Also places that in general have a thriving economy, a thriving and diverse economy, that has lots of places to pull young people into the labor force also tend to be um, places where there's a lower youth disconnection rate. A place like, for instance, Bakersfield, which um, is tends to generally be um, sort of toward the bottom of this list year in, year out. And so if you look at that place, it's a it's a city, very city with a very large share of its population um, having very low incomes. It's not a um, sort of hotbed of universities and, um, you know, it's not the, the Silicon Valley type place of, of California where there's a lot of universities and tons of, of jobs. And so places um, like that tend to have higher rates. Um, overall, we're finding that um, over the years that rural areas uh, generally tend to have higher youth disconnection rates than urban areas. So often if we think about youth disconnection, it tends to, a lot of people pop into their mind in sort of more of an urban um, setting, but um, youth disconnection does tend to be higher in rural areas, which, which makes sense when you think about it, because there are you know, fewer industries, um, fewer uh, institutions of higher learning and so forth that can, can pull in um, the region's young people. Great, thank you, Kristen. Uh, Emma and Louisa, this question is for you. Um, are you able to characterize what kind of employer engagement practices are currently happening? Um, <clears throat> the short answer is no. Um, and that sort of, I think, also speaks to another question in the or comment in the chat about sort of the implementation of practices matters. It's not just, you know, is the practice there or not? Um, and so I think it's important to say that, you know, our tools are really at this high level of saying within this defined scope, you know, what do we know about the presence or absence of certain practices or certain outcomes being measured? Um, but it doesn't go into what needs to be the next step of saying, looking at what's available, like what do we actually know about how these are implemented? Does mining that data help us understand about, you know, what is an effective approach to implementing it versus not? So this is really that first step at that high level of saying what's out there and that next step of digging in is what needs to happen next and what we hope people will use the information to do. Yes, and we did not get a chance to walk through the website itself um, on this call, but if you go to the website, you can look at different filters. And if you're interested in a particular practice, you can look at the programs that are employing that practice. Um, and um, while you won't find more information on that program page, you will find the link to their websites um, and you can dig in though, as Lisa said, getting it comprehensively is the next step in this work. Great, thank you. Kristen, I know this is gonna be hard to answer, but there is a question in reference to when will we have the 2021 data for youth disconnection? <laughs> uh -huh. 
Um, yeah, so we should be able to have it fairly early next year. So in general, the, the American Community Survey releases the data that we require for these kind of calculations, usually like November, December, um, sometimes into January. Um, and so, you know, we'll try to turn that around as quickly as we can. So this year, for instance, the, the data didn't come, the data were delayed in being released by a couple of months. And then the data that we use to calculate um, public use microdata areas um, was also delayed. So we're, we only recently got our hands on that data. And so we're crunching it and sorting it now. So we'll be able to update the national map we have on our website at measureofamerica.org um, soon, fairly soon, um, as soon as we can, we'll be able to do that. And then we're eager to get our hands on the 2021 data as well, just because um, we're wanting it to be, you know, just coming with fewer caveats so that we can say say more things with, with certainty rather than with hand-wringing reluctance. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Kristen. And this is a question for all of the panelists, whoever feels um, comfortable in responding or has an example would be great. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, folks are really eager to understand um, how folks are currently using this information, the resources, the data, um, does anyone have a really good example on a state level or how this data or information or resource has moved towards influencing or impacting policy? Just need one or two examples how folks are using the research, how they're using or can use this information. And I love in the comment box, uh, there was an example of how, yes, I think how we can use this in Mississippi. Um, so it's great to see that real time, seeing something and seeing how they can use it in their work. But if anyone has an example they would like to share of how this uh, work or data has been used to influence policy, um, used on a state level, um, that would be great to hear. Yeah, um, I can, like I said, our, our materials have been out for a month yet, so I don't have those examples, but I know that we're you know, meeting with um, a, a group next week who are interested in using the tools that represent um, state workforce boards. And I think that speaks to this desire to understand how best to serve the WIOA out of school youth population using those um, WIOA funds. Um, and so hopefully the tools will lead to examples and connections for those states in identifying perhaps ways to um, figure out what the best practices are or needs are in their states. And I can just add real quickly, um, we actually at the federal level plan to use the Reconnecting Youth Project to kind of look at those gaps that we have in this population and think about our future research projects and what we should be looking at um, as we move forward. Um, and you know, so um, we were really happy to have Luis and Emma work on this with us um, because it was just like such a great tool. And we actually have some a next step, um, but I can't really share it. So hopefully um, in the next year or so um, that will be coming out. But yeah, we're looking forward to we'll stay tuned, Caitlin, for sure. <laughs> Uh, there was a question in reference to the time frame of when the data comes out to when it's actually released for the public. And yes, it is about a year. Um, it does take that long for us to capture the data from the census and then to do the analysis. So as Kristen shared, we're really hopeful um, early next year to be able to share uh, the latest data with all of you. And at this point, um, we're coming at the end of our webinar and I wanna thank all of our presenters for so generously sharing their time, um, highlighting these amazing resources and research. And I hope that everyone is walking away today from today's webinar with some new um, ideas, some new resources to kind of tap into. Uh, to support case building and to really track progress in our efforts to support Opportunity Youth. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a recording shared with everyone who registered for this webinar. So you will have that, which will include the presentations and contact information for our presenters. So again, thank you all. And that concludes today's webinar. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>